Hey everybody, and welcome to this installment of the Future Grind podcast. I am your host, Ryan O'Shea, and today I'll be speaking with Rob Lee, the CEO and owner of the Pittsburgh Knights. The Knights compete in the growing world of esports, where competitors battle in virtual environments with very real stakes. These may be video games, but according to some metrics, esports leagues already have audience numbers that surpass those of some major sports and its popularity continues to grow. Investors and sponsors are clamoring to get in on the action, but this new industry is not without its share of controversy. We discuss making a living in virtual worlds, the impact of IP laws, the future of entertainment, virtual reality, and more. As always, show notes and more are available at futuregrind.org, where on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever podcasts are found. A video version of this episode is posted on Facebook and YouTube. Make sure to subscribe on all of these platforms, leave a review, and you can also like, comment, and share to spread the word. If you'd like to keep this podcast running, you can donate at futuregrind.org forward slash support. Because of you, this is Future Grind. So now we are here with Rob. Rob, thanks for joining us on the Future Grind podcast. No, thank you for having me. So today we're here to talk about esports, and I feel like a lot of people don't know what that is and can't really wrap their heads around that this industry exists. So we're going to definitely explore that. But when we're talking about this at a high level, what is esports? What even does that mean? So esports is organized professional video gaming, and Believe it or not, um, people watch other people play video games for entertainment. I think uh, that's something, uh, it's, some, it's a hard concept to grasp for other people, and, but for my demographic, that's not. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of what we're, where we live in the, today's world. At. Everyone's kind of like gathering around this thing called esports, and uh, it's, it's a... Uh, it's a new phenomenon, for sure. <laughs> and we're here in the headquarters of the Pittsburgh Knights. What are the Knights? Talk about what this organization is. So the Pittsburgh Knights is an esports team that lives in the esports ecosystem, if you want to call it that, that operates um, as a team, as a brand um, that is headquartered in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, it's no different if you consider yourself a, a sports team that is operating in a league um, like the NFL, right? And your headquarters are in whatever city that you decide in. Um, but for esports, think um, for the Pittsburgh Knights and esports, think uh, Manchester United, where you know Manchester United is in a whole bunch of different games. Esports is very much similar to that. So how popular is this? Let's talk about numbers. How does eSports today compare with traditional established sports leagues? Okay, um, so I think this is where everyone is talking about how new it is, and um, there, there's a huge disconnect because, oh yeah, this thing is so new, but yet it's beating out the, the viewership to other sports, like traditional things, right? Like, I think where it's at, Right now, I think the League of Legends midseason invitational at this this year um, peaked uh, 80 million wow. people watching. So that's more than the NBA Finals, college football, um, the MLB Finals. Um, I think it's shy of 40 million for the Super Bowl. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of the world we live in now today. But um, it's it's on the rise. You know, you probably heard of statistics growing over a year over year of like 40 percent, 38 percent, where that's just kind of unheard of in a different industry. Some of the feedback that people get from this or criticism of this industry is, how can anyone sit there and watch someone play a game? Yet, if you are watching professional sports, that's literally what you're doing. You're watching someone play a game. But where is this popular? You mentioned some impressive numbers there. Is that North America? And how does North America compare with Asia? 
OK, so that, that's, a, that's a good question. Well, no, it's worldwide. So when you talk about traditional sports, you have your football, your basketball, um, your baseball. Um, those sports, those, those, those activities are limited to a region, right? Like the NFL is not. It, it's big, don't get me wrong, worldwide. But the NFL doesn't have teams in China, right? Um, and you know, baseball is America's pastime. Um, when it comes to esports, esports doesn't have a ceiling of like a region. It's global. It's worldwide, and that's why you've seen so much of it um, all over the place. So it's not just America. And yeah, like why would anyone watch esports, or what, why would anyone want to like see anyone play games against each other? Um, it's it's exactly how you said it. Uh, why would anyone want to watch Ben Roethlisberger throw a football on a field? But to explain the phenomenon of how it's just blowing up, um, I think I, I talked about this at the Pittsburgh Entrepreneurs Forum. Um, it's the the intimacy level. Um, technology is evolving um, ever so rapidly, but live streaming has always been there. But it's it's got a platform. So as the demographic um, is evolving, technology is evolving with it, and and kind of commingling um, as. Radio was the backbone for baseball, and television was like the backbone for the NFL. And you kind of see like baseball is like kind of you know it's drifting. It's because of the dopamine effects of like hitting a baseball is like every eight minutes, right? You clap. But in esports, you watch like you you watch intensity every ten seconds. So it's like the dopamine hits it just keep keep going. Um, so all of those sports have the backbone of their 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 technological you know era. Now live streaming is the new thing, right? Like that, you know, no one, I don't think anyone pays for like, cable television anymore. I think all the, the ISPs and all the cable television broadcasters are calling everyone like, hey, you can get this package, but no one wants to buy it. Yeah. So, but live streaming is free because you just, you know, I mean, you pay for the internet, but um, there's no package deal. So um, eSports lives on this. Um, and you get to watch this on a completely different platform. Um, but yeah, the intimacy part. Imagine if you, you know, LeBron James, like, you got to, he, he set up a, a webcam on the basketball court, and he was talking to you, he, you, you, get, you get to tune in to his practice, and not only that you could see this, but you got to ask him questions and, um, inter, you know, and you, you, can, you can talk to him. Um, so that there, you would think that there, in being with a celebrity, there is a wall of separation between myself and LeBron James. I tweet at him, one in a million chance he'll yep. probably tweet back at me. But in esports, that's just not a thing. That wall is gone. Celebrityism, you, you're like you're there with him. You get you're a part of the narrative and the journey that you see a pro player grow up, and uh, you get to see the practices. You get to ask uh, LeBron James about like um, what his Thoughts were after the game, right after what had happened. Um, so it, it, that's the intimate part of esports, and that's why there's no wall anymore. And then people, you know, the players and the talent get to monetize off of that, right? Like you pay five bucks, you're part of their exclusive club. You get their um, you, you get their little emote badge or like their artwork, and you get to support them. So um, when you're along for the journey, like you feel much more connected. That explains the explosion of Ninja, because you, yeah. you were a part of that. We're definitely going to talk more about streaming and the monetization of this, but you mentioned something interesting there, that eSports is global. And which brings up, you are the Pittsburgh Knights. You don't need to be, right? You could just be the Knights based around the world, competing wherever. You don't necessarily need to have a home city. Why Pittsburgh? Why do you have the geographic tag on that? Well. I mean, for us, I think we know the answer to that just from the, the, the bottom of our hearts. But Pittsburgh, because you know that we're from the sports city, why wouldn't Pittsburgh be a part of eSports, right? Um, I see it as a great culture to move into the next generation of entertainment. Um, we're, always, we're always behind on things. And I, I'm tired of that, um, especially when being from Pittsburgh. Um, I think. The reason why I wanted to do it over just the nights is because there's something very special about the city that is kind of like unspoken. Um, 
where it's completely normal to go to church and have like a Steelers jersey on. Yeah. But that's not that's not a reality anywhere else in the world. And I've been around like, or, you know, across the United States. That's just not a thing. But in Pittsburgh, it's completely fine. I don't know why that is. <laughs> but um, it, that's what I wanted to uh, uh, transition into the world of esports. The thing that I kind of discovered in the last couple of years of is this this like this non-attachment to uh, to localization and I wanted to capitalize on that opportunity um, but yeah like it's it's all about the sports culture um, there's a love for it and I wouldn't want Pittsburgh the city of champions to miss out on that the the next evolution of entertainment so what does it mean when someone joins a team such as the Knights what are the benefits of a, an esports team so um, why would any player or professional want to join the Knights? Well, you know, by joining a team, um, you, you are, we are enabling them to achieve their dream of becoming a pro player, right? You get a stability from the team um, and are able to compete um, for, for a while, right? Like if I, if I wanted to play and just play in open leagues um, all the time, right, it would be, you know, how do I make a living off of that, right? Um, it, it'd be quite difficult to to just kind of survive in the space. But attaching yourself to a team creates stability, creates opportunity for you to grow your brand or um, build something from the bottom and have the like it's it's, it's a platform, right? Um, for for people to represent Pittsburgh, right? Um, it's like if it's the same exact way of like Ben Roethlisberger coming from Florida to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, they're joining a professional team and um, with that there comes responsibilities of being a professional gamer. So in addition to the salary that traditional professional sports play their athletes, there's also other benefits. There's health care, there's medical staff on, on, on the roster, there's access to training and training facilities, and there's providing of equipment. Does esports currently have that? I, it's it's not there yet. I'll, I'll be quite honest to you. Um, it's not there yet. I think some teams may offer that. I mean, that's kind of like the competitive advantage of some teams if they do have backings or investors to do that. Um, but most, if, if not all, esports players are considered independent contractors. They do get a salary and, and stipend every month um, for that to, to compete under the brand. Um, some teams offer health care. The last team I was on with Immortals, they did. They also. Um, uh, added uh, um, financial um, advisory um, to help them with their taxes. Because, you know, esports kind of works backwards, right? Like in, in regular traditional sports, you go to college, you could play college football, and then you join the NFL. No, that's not the case here. You, um, right after high school, you become a pro gamer and then make as much money as possible, and then you use that money to go pay for college. That's what ha actually happens. Um, because the longevity of your career is only like three or four years, um, very much similar to like a football player, right? Um, but yeah, there are a lot of different perks of joining a team that offer those things. Those are things that you wouldn't get on if you were just a free agent playing in the open leagues. Um, there is no sense of stability, and that's why joining a team is probably really good for you, just because you have that stability. Um, do, I, do I see where it's going in the future for something like that? Yeah, I see um, stability in the market where um, teams are eventually universally half to provide health care, provide um, financial uh, advisory, or you know er er anything in between, um, for that matter, right? I, I, it would be a dream for me to have my players retire and be able to go to like RMU or Point Park or the University of Pittsburgh or CMU right after, right? Um, as like the the esports uh, retirement home, I guess if you want to call it that. So you mentioned that the career of some of these professional gamers is quite short, and I think one of the biggest challenges that I could see someone facing in this world is choosing what game you're going to specialize in, and then at what point do you leave the game that you're making your money from to try to jump on the next big thing? Because there are some games that have been around for a decade plus that still have tournaments and players, but then there are the big ones today, like Player Unknown's Battlegrounds or Fortnite, who last year no one even knew what they were, and now they're the biggest things out there. So how do you, how do you as a gamer choose what to focus your money and attention on, and how do you deal with this transient environment? Yeah, so great question. I always get that. They're like, oh, what, 
what happens if Halo 1 has a Halo 2 and Halo 3? Well, um, I think you can't look at games as different titles. You have to look at games of their genre, right? A professional player will always be good at their specific genre. Most esports games that came out in the, you know, 20 plus years ago or 10 plus years ago. Um, you know, you got your strategy games and you got your shooters and then this crazy awesome new genre that came out now is Battle Royale, which is pretty much the Hunger Games in a virtual space. It just They just made it into a game. Um, so pro players will always be good at their specific craft. Like uh, let's take Shroud for instance, right? He probably pumped 10,000 hours into using moving a reticule to a dot and point, pulling the trigger to you know kill the dot um, that specific skill is transferred through all games because that mechanic and genre is always the same he's always going to be good at shooters that's no th there's no question about it and, and that that's what makes him so famous right so a pro player like ninja right he's he's really good he was really good at halo um, that's where he started and his Aiming, um, aiming skills transferred into the battle royale genre qu quite flawlessly, right? So uh, there was another player. His name's Cloaksy. He's a he's a great dude. Um, he's on Phase Clan now, but I remember he was really big into H1Z1. First one, first game to really put battle royale on the map, and then his skills moved over to PUBG and now to Fortnite. They're all the same genre. Battle royale is the exact same game. Um, but those skills transfer. So talk to me about esports leagues and tournaments. How do they form? How are they typically run? Are they from the developers or are they from third parties? And how does that work? So it, it's, it just depends, right? Um, you have a ton of different games. Some games that are meant to be esports games, some games that aren't meant to be esports games, but community wants to make it competitive. So. A lot of entrepreneurs out there or, or venture capitalists or investors that want to get into space are trying to tr follow the money. But in reality, it's kind of following where the competitive, like, competitive community is. Um, what I mean by that is um, the games that have a competitive community that want to be the best in a particular game really drives the market, to be honest. Um, so what I mean by that is you know, some games have franchise leagues. Some games have open leagues. Some games have no leagues at all, and you just play a pickup game like a freestyle rap battle and, and with two GameCube controllers and play Super Smash Brothers against each other and hope for the best. And everyone's around you cheering you on on a lower level. Um, this all started in your grandma's basement um, because everyone wanted to have LAN parties because that was the only way to get competitive, like viable competitiveness out can't do it online. There's lag. There's a lot of different variables that could happen. So the only way you can do it is have it at a, a local area network connection. So everyone would come over. I would be like, yo, come over my my mom's house, grandma's house, and we can play. All right. And it got to the point where um, we would fill out, you know, the basement and mom or grandma would get mad. And we're like, OK, fine. We, we can all chip in five dollars, ten dollars. We'll go rent the hotel ballroom down the street. Um, we go down there, and then we fill out uh, all the hotel rooms and all of the, the ballrooms, and we run out of space, and we don't have enough money, or we do have enough money. You know what? Let's just go rent the stadium or convention. And that's how it kind of progressed over the, the years. So that's the, the, the most generic breakdown <laughs> I could really give you. But uh, that's, that's, uh, that's how it kind of evolved. But yeah, some games are franchised. That's where the teams come in. Big guys, you probably have heard Robert Kraft, all these guys buying slots into a specific game. Um, what they're realizing is that they bought only a slot in a one specific game, yeah. right? So I think that there's a disconnect and disruptiveness and not fully educated part of that. Um, esports operates in like a multitude of games. You know, you know, you, you'll take Team Liquid, for example. They're backed by the Capitals, um, the Golden State Warriors and the Wizards. Um, they have a wide variety of games that they're invested into. Um, I think up to like ten, like seven to ten uh, games. So there's many verticals of the business that keep it running, right? When one falters, like Halo Two dies, right? You you have your Halo Three or your next game that um, that you're you're attached to. So what are the next big games? What are the ones that 
the competitors and teams are investing in now to hope to be there at the top when they break through? Mm -hmm. So what are the what are the next games? That's a good question. Um, so where is the competitive drive? I think I think Fortnite's doing really well. Um, it's just really hard on the teams right now because you. You know, a developer announces a hundred million dollars into an ecosystem, but doesn't provide any details on leagues. Doesn't provide any details in the next year or what that is. And then you have a whole bunch of players running to you, like, "Hey, can I be a part of your team? Give me a sixty thousand dollar salary for it." I'm like, "How do I monetize off that if we don't know anything that's going to happen in the future?" Right. So that's up to us to figure that out. Um, and a lot of teams have have yet to have any commitment to that particular game. So what's the next game? Well, the next game is a mixture of finding out what is, where's, the, where's the competition going? Where, where does everyone want to see who the best in that particular game is going to be? And the other one is you need to have a balance of figuring out, well, how do I make a business out of this? How am I able to monetize and keep stability going? All right, which developer is giving me that opportunity to? So you're probably here like um, Vainglory, why other teams are getting part of it. Well, there's competitive drive in it, and then there's also um, developers that are giving some form of rev share um, for the stability for it, right? Some games don't offer that, and that's why some teams aren't part of those games, because you just can't make anything off of it. You can't um, provide player stability, and that's why you always hear, like, um, players come and go, right? It's all over the place. Um, League of Legends is a really good um, example of a, of a really nice competitive ecosystem because there's rev share, there's stability, um, there's franchise leagues you pay in, and you're, and you're there forever, essentially. So we mentioned that some of the ways to make money from this gaming is doing well in tournaments and winning prize money. But then there's the whole other ecosystem of professional gaming, which is streaming and getting sponsorships or donations. We're doing that all online. And I saw that the Knights have their own stream team. So in addition to the competitors that play in the sanctioned tournament events, you have streamers that are part of the team. How do they relate to this, to this whole dynamic? So for, for us, um, for, for the stream team, we have a lot of different influencers that want to support us um, and provide us with um, support on the back end to build the brand. Um, for them, they, they get an exchange of services for them. By all means, I can't, for, for a team, yes, I can monetize them and their likeness rights to um, in, in the leagues, right? There's rev share. Anything when it comes to the eSports team, um, the Every revenue stream is exactly the same as a sports team. Down to ticket sales, down to sponsorship, down to merchandise, whatever. Um, the only two differences is that prize money and virtual goods. Virtual goods being the in-game items that you sell in the game. When you are winning, you get items in the game. The publishers let you do that now these days. Um, but on the other end, for streamers, um, the way we um, are able to work with that is their streaming minutes, their um, their their accessibility to get eyeballs onto a specific channel where your brand is there, and we kind of like act as pseudo agents if that makes sense, um, where we come to them and provide them the opportunities to monetize even more from their streaming channels, um, not just the subscription buttons, the donations and whatnot, and we provide them with. Um, with concurrent viewership, right? Like, a streamer comes to me like, hey, I'm streaming all this time, but I don't have enough time to edit this video on a weekly basis because I'm streaming just so much. Help me do that. And I'm like, yeah, of course, I'll do that. Uh, slap the night stuff on there. What if we get like a Heinz catch-up sponsorship, right? I can use his eyeballs to add to the viewership of the nights. Boom, Heinz catch-up bottle button on your stream as well. Um, that's kind of like the exchange of services there. So how does IP and copyright work in this world? I imagine that you said that some developers of games have their own tournaments. Do other developers get mad when third parties try to capitalize and put structure and organization around their property? Or even when they're talking about streamers, I imagine some game developers don't want the secrets or endings of some of these games to be broadcast, just as movie studios wouldn't want that to be broadcast. Yeah, so that's 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 a always a hot topic in esports because no one has ever owned the pigskin, right? No one, no one owns that. No one owns the IP for that. But in esports, that is the biggest hump and obstacle for esports because someone owns the intellectual property of the game. Someone owns Star Wars, believe it or not. Uh. Um, but yeah, so 
that's the biggest hump and billion dollar question right now is how to monetize esports and everyone's trying to get into the space because they see it's booming but they can't grasp that they can't have the football so Jerry Jones and Robert Kraft enter a space but they don't own Overwatch they don't own it when you purchase a football part of the rev share of purchasing a football goes to the NFL that doesn't happen in esports so everyone's trying to figure out this billion dollar question how do I get the rev share from like these games and there's a lot of noise and confusion out there when people are coming into the space and they want to put their money where their mouth is, but they don't know how to get it back. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a huge, huge um, question of how to do that. Well, some games operate in that space and allow for rev share. Some games don't. Um, and you know, teams form together um, to try to leverage against game developers. Hey, I'm not going to be a part of your, you know, our fan base, so I'm not going to be a part of your game if you're not going to kind of give some rev share. So there's like some argument back and forth. There's like this little triangle of like game developer teams and players. And players is the biggest circle of them all because they, they actually get rewarded the most. <laughs> um, well, well, not really, but so sometimes. And then the developers get this huge, huge rev share because they get all the uh, microtransactions, they get all the um, all the subscriptions to the games, and then you got the teams. It's like the smallest one, and they're trying to make this the biggest one and trying to figure out um, how to do it while the developers have the keys to the kingdom. So it, it just really depends, right? Um, I think uh, the franchise leagues, Overwatch and League of Legends, are trying to let let it happen, um, create and foster an esports ecosystem. I mean, like Valve and CS:GO, they're like, here, just just take our IP and do what you want with it. Nintendo um, tried pulling some of the some of the stuff from the stream. They're like, you can't stream Melee um, anymore. And then like there was a huge audience backlash behind it. They're like, what are you doing? And they're like, whoa, calm down, kids. We'll let you stream our game. But yeah, they it, it's it's really nerve wracking to see investors be scared to, of the space because essentially the developers have all the keys in the kingdom and they can pull out the rug from under you at any time. And then that's scary. So yes, billion dollar question that needs to be answered, let me know. I mean, I have a couple answers for it, but um, we'll see. We'll see what happens in the near future. So talk to me a bit about your path. What is your background and how did you get into this whole world of professional gaming? Oh, wow. Um, let's, let's go back. I'll make it, uh, I'll make it short. Um, grew up um, high school, Bridgeville, South Fayette, and Pittsburgh. Went out to college in Florida. Immediately went to the Hollywood and entertainment industry because I was a film major. Um, at the age of 19, just went out. Um, did that. I, uh, I interned, account managed for a Olympic snowboarder. His name is Shot in White. Um, for quite some time, juggling that, another job with uh, a direct TV show host from G4 Television, Kevin Pereira, um, back in the day. Learned everything about the entertainment business from him. And then I transitioned over to eSports. And the only reason why that is because we were covering E3, and I, ran, I was a fan for the longest time, and I ran into uh, this guy at a in and out burger joint after E3. No one knew who he was. I knew who he was because I was a fan. He was the owner of SK Gaming. I was like, hey, how do, how do what's, what's this? What's going on? How can I help you? And the rest is history after that. Um, joined SK as a video producer, um, was interviewing players, doing this, a podcast, very, very much like what we're doing right now, um, and, and making content. So then I started to understand what players were going through, what teams were understanding the space. And it was very small at the time. Started a team called the Los Angeles Renegades. Um, later sold off, helped manage that. Sold off to the Hirsch family in Dallas and then um, Jonas Trebko, an NBA player. Went to Berlin for a little bit. I managed a amateur team all the way up to the pro league level for League of Legends, uh, the Misfits. Um, that was later acquired by sci-fi channel um, owner and uh, the Miami Heat. I was like, man, I can't live in Europe anymore. I got to go back home. So I went back home to the United States and uh, joined my first venture capitalist team, the Immortals. Got a wonderful offer from them. And I was their creative director for a while, created the brand, 
brand, helped with a brand identity with an awesome team over there. Um, their notable investors were Crosscut Ventures, Lincoln Park, Lionsgate Films, and the Memphis Grizzlies. Then uh, I got, I was tired, got depressed, took a year off. I was like, I, I don't know what to do. Then I came back to Pittsburgh, it was hometown. No place like home. Um, and then I saw an opportunity. I was like, man, I want to I wanna start the Knights. Um, had the Knights branding for, for a couple years before even coming back to Pittsburgh. It, it was already being created years ago, and then I brought it back to Pittsburgh, which is cool. While well, in professional sports, you often see at least the players and then perhaps the team owners would have their own union. So there is a minimum salary that must be paid. There's bargaining rights that are put in there. Is there any equivalent to that in the gaming world that perhaps the competitors could say, this is what we feel that our rights should be and any league would have to abide by that to maybe help some of the stuff from happening or a third party arbitration part process if there is contention between one of the leagues or tournaments and a competitor or team? Um, so some do exist in some games. CSGO just started their player union. Love it, great. I think it's just years a little bit late. <laughs> um, I would love to see a team union, you know, that leverage against developers. I'd love to see player unions across all of, all of these sports. But to be truthful, having a minimum or trying to find the market value of games that just don't have the ecosystem for it, it's hard to judge how much a player should make in a game that doesn't have any revenue, yeah. right? So that won't exist and there won't ever be one that exists for it because there's not enough funding from all the games that they, high res is not gonna work with Riot to make their own union for each of each other, right? So that's why I'm talking about the developers have so much, they have the keys to the kingdom. They dictate it and they're a little bit at fault for not being able to help it as well because, you know, I don't, I don't think, yeah, you know, you hear Riot like, oh, there's a player union. They, they're, they're kids, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. who's going to represent them? Um, and will they ever take it seriously? I think there was some Twitter controversy a little bit about the, some of the player, players from League of Legends um, where I think uh, I'm a good friend, Jacob Wolf, tweeted out. He was like, this is what happens when the players from the game just don't take a player union seriously and some player got traded and whatnot. There was a little bit of controversy of that. So um, will that happen in the space? It can. I just, it's hard to get a lot of people to do it mm -hmm. together when we're forced to cannibalize each other in an open market. Yeah. You know? So in an open market, we're against each other. In reality, we should be working together but how do you dictate which teams should survive and which should be in the league, right? There's no overarching um, barrier to like make that happen. And that's why each game has its own individual ecosystem that they operate within. Um, I'd like to see it change. And uh, I talked about it a little bit before, but you know, the only real answer to it of a player's union or a team union or whatnot is, is just the teams just make the game themselves. So you mentioned there how young some of these players actually are. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that a lot oftentimes they are before college, they finish their career and go to college. So talk me through the career of a professional gamer. At what age do they get started? At what age do they typically go pro? And what is it that ages them out of professional competition? So, wow, that's a lot of factors that come involved with that. So most. A lot of games, you'll probably hear about really young kids that are getting into this. They're still in high school. Um, some, even some pro teams make it a requirement that you have to be 16 plus or 18 plus, depending on the game. I know that we had a run in with that for, um, for PUBG because what, two of our players a long time ago, this was 2017 of I Am Oakland, um, the game was rated you know, M and they had, had to be 17 plus. Mm, yeah. um, or no, I'm sorry, 18 plus. And they were 17. And we couldn't participate. We had a great team, couldn't participate. Um, so that was the lack of uh, on our end to give them the opportunity for that. So they had, we had to wait, essentially. Great team. Um, so how, how does that work? So some games, they just call young players, and they're able to do it. Um, some games, like Counter-Strike, 
players in their 30s that are still playing at a professional level. So there, in that particular game, ageism doesn't exist, right? League of Legends, something that updates every two weeks, requires um, adaptive and active learning for you to be a part of it. And that's why you see so many League of Legends players still being young and, um, and the burnout rate for them are like two, three years, mm -hmm. right? And it's just very rare for a player to go even further than that because of this just an ever-changing game. It's like changing football, like, over the rules. Yeah. Imagine if you, you change, like, oh, yeah, you, you, there's a fifth down now, or, like, um, you know, there's, there's three downs now, or, like, there's, there's the shape of the bottle is different. Roethlisberger would be furious, yeah. and he would burn out in, like, a year. <laughs> uh, that's what it's like. So... It just really depends on the game. Like Super Smash Brothers Melee, it's always been the same game forever, and the pro players have always been the same. I think Mango's in his like late 30s and has a family, so it just really depends. So we referenced Ninja a couple times in this, mm -hmm. and he is one who has really blown up in his game on the streaming platform Twitch. What does that do for the industry overall? And just give an idea of who Ninja is for the audience who might not know. So. Ninja, his name is uh, Richard Blevins. He, fun fact, he used to be my Renegades Halo player. Oh. So he started his career in Halo. I remember getting his, his Bud Light sponsorship and watching him blossom. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I, I knew you when you were a baby. So I saw, uh, saw him grow up uh, and, and start the whole streaming career. For him, it was like this mixture of um, growing his stream and he was he was no different than you know dr speck shroud all these guys they just had this large streaming following and he saw an opportunity and seized it because he was in a growing game it was a mixture of all these things and he's a great dude he's just awesome awesome guy to like to represent the space and to see him play with drake play with juju smith schuster Marshmallow, all these celebrities because of the Fortnite craze. It was awesome. It was like this, he put esports on mainstream media. I mean, it was already, but he like further did it and legitimized it and was like, this is a real thing. They're streaming and there's esports. Great. It wakes up the world a little bit um, and where he's at. For him, it was, it was a good mixture of all of it, including that, you know, I think Twitch allowed, if you watch and subscribe, you got this awesome skin. So it was like this cool um, mixture of all this goodness that was happening all at once. And that, that explained the explosion of Ninja. And I don't think that anything can really recreate it unless you did, you know, d did it same um, with another good pro player um, with the equivalent of Drake, right? I don't know, Wiz Khalifa. <laughs> Um, but yeah, what it does for the, the space, it legitimizes it, it puts more eyes on it, it, I think like, we got contacted a little bit ago about how some kids were asking their parents to pay for like coaching lessons from pro players in Fortnite because like kids in, in high schools were, weren't being friends with them because they weren't good enough. It's like paying, it's the equivalent of parents paying swimming lessons for their kids. It's the same thing. Yeah. So I think it's very interesting that part of Ninja's success is some entrepreneurial nature to that. You're finding your own sponsorships. You're getting your marketing yourself. You're getting your message out there. And I think from talking to you, I can tell that you are also very entrepreneurial. In fact, uh, you have partnered with the Carnegie Mellon's Entrepreneurial Institute to help people there who are starting up startup companies. You're listed on their website as a mentor. So what? How did? How in your mind? Does entrepreneurship relate to esports and making a brand for yourself? So the world has changed to you are your own independent influencer, your own business. So like when you see Ninja and all these Twitch streams and all these streams, imagine when you go on Ninja's channel, you're not watching him, you're watching his TV channel. It's how the you know evolution of technology has been going. We've talked about it before, where you know, where is technology going? Well, live streaming is a thing, it's free, so everyone is making their own platform. It's like the YouTube stuff when it first came out, right? Philip DeFranco and all those guys, they're investing in themselves. They're their, their own entrepreneurs, right? So, um, you know, uh, Ninja started off on a team, Luminosity, and they probably handled his, all of his things, right? His, his 
partnerships, the sponsorships, the things that he was doing, what buttons to use, what is he advertising, and then he's off on his own. Now, you know, he's probably going to leave Luminosity in a little bit, where he's going to have to handle that himself, right? And he's creating his own business, his own TV channel. It's like the guy that owns, you know, he, he owns AMC, right? He's like his own AMC, so he has to produce and make his own content. Yeah, sure, he's making $1.5 million a month, right? He's, he's self-investing back into that. He's, gonna, he's probably going to make like his own um, you know, production company at that point, right? He's going to con constantly put out content for people to watch and want to be like a part of the, his own journey. So yeah, there is an entrepreneurial level to it. And um, I, think, I think that's a wake-up call to all players around, too. And that's something where it's going to be ideal for him to well, ideal for a lot of players to do that, and they start to see the value of content and um, eyeballs more than just their competition. And those are those are the players that have longer careers than three years. <laughs> so this is Future Grind, where we talk about the implications of emerging technologies, particularly on society. And I think esports is one of the first ways we're seeing the virtual world impact the physical world where people are getting paid and having careers based on their skills in a virtual environment. And I think that's expanding to other areas as well. You have musicians or speakers who can put on shows in a virtual environment, or you even have people who are making goods and services now, making digital goods or selling digital real estate, and they're actually selling these things in a digital market. So I think kind of gone are the days where we considered what happens in the virtual world as fake or inconsequential and now we are, I think, as a society, realizing that what happens in a virtual world isn't fake or any less real than what happens in the world we're surrounded by now. Do you see esports as a driver of this? And what role do you think it plays in this overall societal shift? Hmm. Well, uh, the, the last question there, what role does it play? I think it's going to be a, a new sense of entertainment very much. I mean, like, you know, you watch a movie like Ready Player One, right? That's like the, s the center of attention. Um, and I hate to compare it to that because I, I, I don't see a dystopian future like that. But um, yes, it's going to be the next generation of entertainment for sure, the center of it. Because if I wanted to watch football, I'm not going to watch people play uh, Madden, but I'm going to watch people play real football. But, you know, I can't really get to see people in knights in shining armor fighting dragons and casting fireballs at each other, right? That's just not reality. But esports is a sense of, um, to, like, this suspense of belief that you could do that for in, in an athletic way where you can combine the two. So, yeah, I think, you know, that would be the next generation of entertainment because like, there's just this fantasy element to it, and that's the craze, right? Um, yeah, I, I think that's where it would go, and that's where esports would fit into the future. Um, for the future real estate, the virtual space, I think that's a little bit out of the esports realm, right? I see virtual reality being like a huge thing, right? I can see it being part of an evolving movies, right? Imagine like you know, Inglorious Bastards, that one scene where, you know, you have the, the Nazi in the corner and the other guy that's hiding the Jews under the floorboard. And imagine in, like, the, re the repeat value of watching that scene in virtual reality, right? You can see the perspective under the floorboards, watch him closely, right? It, it changes the whole dynamic of how you view media. Um, and that's kind of like where the future is. Or, you know, in one scene, um, one character can be extremely deceptive, but you watch it from a different perspective, and then it's like, wow, I can watch it from behind him, and he was like holding a knife the entire time, and that's the scary factor of it, right? There's so many different elements of that. Um, but yeah, that's where I think esports would go um, for virtual real estate and, and whatnot that I, I, I couldn't tell you. So I'm glad you brought up virtual reality there, because that's where I'm going with my next question here, is VR is a gaming platform in some ways, but it is in no way as popular as the traditional gaming that we see. Although in some ways, it's getting more and more immersive. We now have tactile vests that we can wear where you can actually sense things on your body as if it was happening to you 
movements in physical reality are now translated. In the shoes. Exactly. <laughs> are now translated into a digital space. So in that way, it is kind of getting more and more like traditional sports where physical movements kind of matter more and more. Do you see a point where VR gaming becomes on the level of some of these traditional games in the world of esports, or is it its own entity? Um, I do. I, I think it. I think it melds. I, I think there's a mixture, right? When we come closer to you know the goggles that you wear for virtual reality to actually being glasses or even contact lenses, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll see it for sure. Um, do I see an arena where people aren't playing on their uh, computers, but they're like in this like gyroscope and they're like. It, it matters about being an athlete and you're throwing like a fire football through the field. Yes, I think that's where it would see, um, where I could see it happening, right? I see um, technology evolving where you see that and then you have the holograms like fighting each other, right? That's why we had a knight, right? Knights ride horses and slay dragons and kill other animals, so that's why we chose a knight. Uh, big whoop. Um, but yeah, I think it would consume it. I think that's where it would go. Um, and virtual reality is, is, I think, it's not the answer, but I think it would just be another platform where you would be able to see it. Um, virtual reality can show you different ways to form, like to show um, different ways to uh, view or perspectives of the current ones, right? And that's just what it's going to be. It's going to be an enabler. So what's next? What does the future of esports hold? What are the challenges currently facing this industry that need to be overcome? And where do the Pittsburgh Knights fit into this? Where where does esports go? I think esports will continue being the same until we are able to overcome the obstacle of IP and intellectual property rights. Where the Pittsburgh Knights fall under in that is putting Pittsburgh on the map in a space that is already existing. Um, and also, I, I don't want to see Pittsburgh behind anymore. We're behind in some ways. You know, early bird gets the worm, but second mouse gets the cheese. So I think that was some great insight there. If people want to find out more about the Pittsburgh Knights and the esports community, or you yourself, where can they go to do that? And where would you suggest they go to check out more? So for the Knights, you can check us out on our website, uh, knights.gg, gg for a good game, um, or our Twitter, knightsgg, Instagram, just Knights, Facebook, uh, uh, knightsgg, and our YouTube, Pittsburgh Knights, on there as well. Um, but if you want to get more of a CEO perspective, you can follow me. Um, my in-game alias, everyone knows me for, is Leonix. Um, people around here in Pittsburgh knows me as Rob Lee. Or, um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's where you can find us. Sounds good. Well, I appreciate you coming on the podcast and sharing out some of this information. No, oh, thank you for having me. Hey, everyone. Ryan O'Shea again, and thank you for listening to my interview with Rob Lee. Remember to check out the show notes and more at futuregrind.org. Make sure to subscribe, and you can also like, comment, and share to spread the word. Till next time, this is Future Grind.